So if you were a Jewish immigrant to the United States in the 1830s or 40s, or even earlier, what would have been the first Jewish institution to be created in the community that you settled in? A synagogue? No, probably not. In fact, the first thing that, that we created were cemeteries. Mm. Cemeteries were necessary because the need for them couldn't be deferred. If somebody died, you had to have a sacred place to bury somebody. There were no secular burial grounds in those days. Everything was a churchyard. So the Jews could not rely on a civic cemetery to bury their dead. They had to have their own land. So when the 23 Jews arrived in New York's or in New Amsterdam to practice their religion, they were publicly forbidden to have a cemetery or to have virtually any public institutions. They certainly couldn't erect a new building because they were too poor. They began worshiping in a uh, oh, somebody's house perhaps or in the back room of somebody's store, which was very typical, probably in rented quarters. The congregation that we know as Sheriff Israel, the Spanish Portuguese synagogue, which now sits on West Central Park uh, Avenue, uh, is uh, dated from about 1654. They began to worship at least a little bit by the time, just after they arrived. The formal charter of the synagogue was not uh, authorized until 1698. The first building was erected on Mill Street, and the map that you can see on the uh, screen uh, shows a red line, which was Mill Street, it's now called William Street, uh, and the green line is the northern wall of Manhattan. In those days, uh, the wall was uh, in wood and a palisade against uh, Indians and uh, intruders. Uh, today it's uh, called Wall Street. And uh, uh, you can see also a picture of the earliest synagogue uh, that was erected in 1730. Now each of the original six Jewish communities in colonial America had a synagogue, but just one. All of them followed a Spanish-Portuguese ritual which was a little bit different from the style of worship that was common in Northern Europe. Most of the Jews by 1720 were already Jews of Ashkenazi descent. That is, they came from Northern Europe. They were from uh, f Eastern France, from Germany, Austria, Switzerland, uh, and even Poland. Uh, th they outnumbered the Jews of Spanish Portuguese origin. But the uh, leadership of the community was still very much in the Spanish Portuguese hands and early minutes of the synagogues were all kept in Ladino, which was a um, uh, language that was spoken by Jews from this area, from the Mediterranean area, or in Portuguese. And all of the uh, officials were known by their uh, Portuguese uh, titles. Every significant Jew in each community belonged to the synagogue. There was tremendous pressure uh, put on by the community for people to belong. They needed everybody's help to make sure that Jewish life could succeed and prosper in this new world. The synagogue provided all of the services that were necessary for a Jew in the community. They were done by a series of subcommittees of the synagogue, which were called chevras, or plural in today's Hebrew, chavrot. Uh, 
Education, both Jewish and general, was provided in a synagogue school. And there were a number of Jewish day schools uh, in each uh, area uh, that provided for Jewish children who could learn secular skills as well as Jewish studies. Burial services were provided by what was called the Hevra Kedisha, the Sacred Society, and this, this society also maintained the cemetery. Kosher and Passover supplies were uh, prepared uh, in the home or in, uh, by a few people in each community who knew something about the rituals of how to slaughter meat or how to prepare food. And it's entirely possible that the uh, level of kosher or kashrut uh, was uh, not very high. Uh, some of the practices were questionable because they did the best they could, but there were very few people who were really skilled in this area. The charitable aspect of the community was also uh, undertaken by these chevras or chavurot. Uh, they supported poor brides when necessary. They visited the sick. They took care of the needy. Uh, they saw to the needs of visitors and transients in the community, and they took care of virtually everything else. So this was one institution, one synagogue in each community that took care of virtually everything. And each of these uh, societies, or chavorot, had a leadership group uh, or a board, uh, but of course, because of the limited number of people in each community, uh, they were a set of interlocking directorates, and the same people ran just about everything. Now, what kind of leadership did they have? Well, for a long time, for almost 200 years, there were no official professionals. Lay leaders, or semi-lay leaders, took care of the needs of the community. The closest one to a rabbi was a man named Gershom Mendes Satius, who was the unordained cantor or chazan of Sheriff Israel Congregation in New York City. Uh, you can see his picture. He was a very handsome man. He was a very significant man in the community. Uh, uh, he uh, served on the board of King's College, which was Columbia University. And uh, when it came time, uh, for a uh, fast day, a public fast day, he often would lead the congregation in prayer. The first ordained rabbis did not come until about 1839 or 1840. There's a little debate. Uh, most people say that the first ordained rabbi in this country was a man named Abraham Rice, who came to Baltimore in 1840 and served Nidche Yisrael congregation, which eventually became Baltimore Hebrew congregation. He came in 1840 and uh, served for about eight or nine years until he left the rabbinate and went into the real estate business. Now, other people will argue that S.M. Isaacs in New York came a year earlier in 1839 it's not terribly important. What is important is to know that most of American Jewry had no professional leadership until the 1850s. There was, of course, a real problem in this situation of getting adequate religious service. So if you had a circumcision that needed to be performed on your newborn son, the only ritual circumciser in the entire Middle Atlantic area lived in Philadelphia. And uh, he was unavailable a lot of the time because he was off doing somebody else. So you had to wait and be flexible. And I think the flexibility that was occasioned by this lack of services often uh, meant that uh, American Jews grew up understanding the need to be adaptive. Uh, and when we get to the history of Reform Judaism in America, we will find out that uh, flexibility and adaptation were really the key to how Jews survived 
in the early days of American Jewish life. In the outlying regions, uh, 30, 40, 50 miles away from a major city, Jews lived as best they could, often with no other Jewish neighbors for miles and miles around. And during the High Holy Days and Passover, it was not uncommon to find people closing up their businesses for 10 or 12 days and moving into the city where there was a synagogue and where they could practice Judaism in a much more formal and systematic way. People tried to be faithful to tradition. They were very strong in their desire to be Jewish. But they also needed to understand that this new world required flexibility, adaptation. All of the colonial synagogues in America were essentially branches or outposts of one synagogue in Europe. And that was the synagogue called Beavis Marks, which was in the east end of London. And if they had questions, they would often write questions to the leadership of Beavis Marks and wait for the answer. How do I do this? What's the right thing to do here, there, so on. This adaptation or flexibility puts the issue of acculturation in a new perspective because, of course, uh, much of what they had to do was use uh, what was the culture that surrounded them and make the best that they could. Now, no North American community had more than one synagogue until 1825. In 1825 in New York City, there were enough Jews of German origin that they could set up their own congregation. And this was called B'nai Jeshurun, and it was set up on Elm Street in New York in 1825. Uh, uh, and, and I'm sorry, in 1869. But uh, there were uh, a number of other synagogues by that time. In 1860, there were actually 14 synagogues in New York City. There is scant evidence of specifically Jewish culture in the colonies. They took part in the activities that the majority offered. Now, there is a wonderful experience with Harvard University. Harvard was founded in 1836, in 1636, and they advertised rather shortly thereafter uh, in 1720 for a Harvard, uh, for a, a Hebrew instructor. Now, they wanted somebody uh, to teach Hebrew, but uh, because this person was teaching uh, future ministers, or as they called them in Puritan New England, the divines, this person had to be a Christian. There was a Puritan background to all of this. When the Puritans came to uh, Plymouth Rock and then to Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 1600s, they were fleeing religious persecution in England and a little bit in Holland. And one of their experiences was that the New Testament was the book of the persecutors. So they turned in part to the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible for inspiration. In the Massachusetts Bay Colony they issued uh, law codes in 1640 and in 1644, and about half of the law codes in each case were actually quotations from the laws of the Torah. One of the motifs that they used, one of the narratives that they found most attractive, was the story of the Exodus from Egypt. They understood themselves as fleeing Israelites with Pharaoh being the king of England and the Egyptians being the British church. And so they left, they went across the sea, in their case the Atlantic Ocean, and they went to New England where they established a new Jerusalem.
This was going to be the new Israel. And if you look at the map of New England even today, there are a slew of towns that have biblical names uh, all over the map. Uh, it shows how these uh, pil pilgrims and Puritans wanted to say, we are the successors of the people of the Bible. The Hebrew program at Harvard prepared people for preaching in churches, and they also wanted to prepare people to go out and convert the Indians. They had the notion that the American Indians were actually the Lost Ten Tribes of Israel. And of course, what would the Lost Ten Tribes of Israel speak except Hebrew? So they needed to be able to speak Hebrew. And in fact, most of the uh, uh, universities in colonial New England taught Hebrew. Well, a guy named Judah Mon Monus, who was a Jew from Italy, a Sephardic Jew, uh, applied for the job uh, to teach Hebrew. And he got the job. But he also had to convert to Christianity in 1722. Monus published the first Hebrew grammar in America. It's the f in fact, it's the first Hebrew book published in the colonies. And there is a uh, copy that survives, uh, which uh, uh, has his name uh, as the author, Judah Monus, comma, A.M., arts master. But some wacko student, probably a sophomore, crossed off the uh, arts ma uh, major and wrote ass major. Apparently, they didn't like Mr. Monus very much. The graduation ceremonies of most of these universities were held in Greek, in Latin, and in Hebrew because they believed that they were really speaking the language of their Lord and Savior. All of the colonial universities were the same. And so if you look, for example, at the Seal of Yale University, which we've put on the screen, uh, you will see uh, that um, uh, Hebrew uh, is very much a part of that uh, uh, seal. In Newport, Rhode Island, there was a congregational minister named Ezra Stiles. Stiles had probably the largest library, uh, certainly north of Pennsylvania. Thomas Jefferson may have had a better library in Virginia, but Stiles had an amazing library and a large part of it was in Hebrew because he was completely fluent in Hebrew. Mm. And Newport was one of those ports where ships coming from England and headed, or Holland, coming uh, across the Atlantic, uh, headed for the Caribbean, would put in and rest for a, a while, uh, sometimes a month, until they took off again. One of the frequent travelers back and forth between the Caribbean and New England uh, and New England, and then eventually Europe uh, was a rabbi by the name of Chaim Karigal. Uh, and you can see a picture of both Stiles and Karigal on the screen. Stiles uh, was also the fifth president of Yale University. He was not a small-time guy. Karagal would stay with him in uh, Newport uh, uh, for uh, the time that he had to lay over until he would go uh, on and usually end up in Barbados. Uh, they discussed Hebrew texts, they discussed religious ideas, uh, the, they talked about how the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible was the basis of Christianity, and there was a great deal of understanding and camaraderie between the two of these men. In the colonial era, there was a great deal of respect for minority rights. Now, that does not mean that there weren't some limitations. In most places, a Jew could not aspire to public office. You had to take an oath uh, based on Christianity, and sometimes there was outright discrimination. But the conclusion that I want you to have is 
that Jewish life in the colonies was considerably better and freer and there was greater opportunity than virtually anywhere else in Europe. And so we'll continue next time with Jews as they reach into the American Revolution.